Tonight, not so happy. China cries foul over the results of elections in Taiwan as the anti-China candidate manages to become the next president of the island nation. The world reacts, but China criticizes all, calling it a violation of the One China policy. The new king in town. Denmark gets a new king and celebrations reaches as far as the shores of Australia. After taking the throne, the newly crowned King Frederick made his first appearance on the balcony of Christenborg Palace in Copenhagen. So it begins. The race for president in the most powerful nation in the world begins with the first caucus of the election getting underway in Iowa. Can Donald Trump pull through the harsh weather to clinch a victory? Or will Haley hail all over his parade? Grandson Mo, a loving gesture, 50 years in the making to ensure his grandmother feel good, goes global. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Mahish Jani. A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to World News Tonight. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us tonight as well. There's a lot of stories, as always. We have a new king in Denmark, and also China is not happy. So let's begin that story. Uh, we want to first take you to Taiwan. Now, China has criticized the UK, US, and other governments for congratulating the winner of Taiwan's presidential election. Beijing accused several nations of interfering in China's internal affairs after world leaders sent messages to President-elect Lai ching tae following his victory on Saturday. And China, which claims Taiwan as part of its territory and considers it a breakaway province, has accused Mr. Lai and his Democratic Progressive Party of being dangerously separatist. China has accused the U.S. of sending a gravely wrong signal to those pushing for Taiwan's independence after Saturday's election result. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken sent Taiwanese President-elect William Lai a message of congratulations following the result. Beijing called the message a violation of Washington's commitment to maintain only unofficial ties with Taiwan. Mr. Lai has vowed to protect Taiwan from an increasingly aggressive China. But Beijing sees Taiwan as its territory and fiercely challenges any government that says otherwise. Other Western countries, including the UK, France and Germany, congratulated the new leader. Meanwhile, Nauru has severed diplomatic ties with Taiwan in favor of China just days after Taiwanese voters elected a new president. Nauru's government said it would no longer recognize Taiwan as a separate country, but rather as an inalienable part of China's territory. China has, over the past years, been poaching Taiwan's diplomatic allies. Taiwan called the timing of the move China's retaliation against our democratic elections. Nauru's diplomatic switch leaves just 12 countries still keeping diplomatic ties with Taipei, including Guatemala, Paraguay and the Marshall Islands. Now the World Economic Forum has released its Chief Economist Outlook report for 2024, painting somewhat a bleak picture of the global economy. Now, over half of the Chief Economists surveyed anticipated a weakening global economy spurred by tight financial conditions, increasing geopolitical tensions and the rapid advance advancement of generative artificial intelligence. Now, today is the first day of the World Economic Forum 2024 in Davos, Switzerland. Global political and business elites are gathering once again in Davos. The Swiss ski resort hosts the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and French President Emmanuel Macron are among those expected, alongside thousands of business leaders. But the meeting has rarely faced a more tense or complex backdrop, with talks due on how to end wars in Ukraine and Gaza. One focus is whether Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will meet Chinese Premier Li Chang during the event. On Sunday, Ukraine Presidential Chief of Staff Andrei Yermak remained hopeful. I, I didn't see the final schedule of the meetings of the presidents. We know that uh, the Prime Minister of China will be as well here. Let's see. Zelensky will speak in Davos later in the week. As for Gaza, the White House says Blinken will bring together key players. 
That includes Israel's president and the leaders of Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, countries that have emerged as power brokers in the region. It all overshadows the usual economic themes at Davos, though they too look unusually complex. On the agenda will be the future for interest rates and the world's mounting pile of debt. A keenly awaited debut will be made by Argentina's new president, Javier Millet, voted in on a promise of sweeping economic reforms. But one figure looming large at Davos won't actually be there. Donald Trump was the star attraction in some previous years. Oh no, I have great confidence in the Senate. But is staying away this time to focus on his re-election bid. He didn't even get a mention in the WEF's annual Global Risks Report, published each year ahead of Davos. But the possibility that he might win, and the consequences that might have, are very much on the unofficial agenda. Well, Denmark has a new king following the historic abdication of the, of the country's longest reigning monarch, Queen Margareta II. Braving near freezing temperatures, thousands of people converged on central Copenhagen for the succession, where the 83-year-old passed on the throne to her eldest son with the signing of a declaration in parliament. King Frederick X is now the head of Europe's oldest monarchy. Huge crowds gathered in the Danish capital, Copenhagen, on Sunday to witness history, as Denmark's King Frederick X acceded to the throne. He succeeds his mother, Queen Margrethe II, who formally abdicated after 52 years as monarch. 83-year-old Margrethe stunned the nation on New Year's Eve when she announced she would become the first Danish monarch in almost 900 years to voluntarily relinquish the throne. In attendance Sunday were Margrethe, Frederick, his Australian-born wife Mary, who is now queen, and their oldest son Christian, 18, who is the new heir to the throne. Denmark has one of the oldest monarchies in the world. Tens of thousands from all over the country braved the cold for the event, a sign of the popularity the monarchy enjoys in the nation of nearly six million. The couple will continue to reside with Margrethe, who will retain her title as queen, in their respective palaces at the Amalienborg Royal Complex. A recent survey indicated that 82% of Danes expect Frederick to do well or very well in his new role, while 86% said the same about Mary. Now, the new Queen of Denmark, Queen Mary, is born in Australia. So not just uh, Danish people who are thrilled that they have a new queen, but Australia itself seems to be jubilant about, about Queen Mary. Now, following that, uh, for us tonight is other Dinner, Binet Senviratna, who joins me now from Melbourne, Australia, with the latest on that story. Binet. Mahish, while Denmark celebrated the coronation of a new king, there are festivities too. Half a world away, right here in Australia, Crown Princess Mary was born on the Australian island of Tasmania and met Prince Frederick in a chance encounter in a busy Sydney bar during the 2000 Olympic Games. Denmark's ambassador to Australia said that Mary has become a natural leader. The couple met at a bar called the Slip Inn during the Sydney Olympics in 2000, which was also celebrating the coronation of the new Danish king. Crown Princess Mary renounced her Australian citizenship many years ago, but her journey from working in real estate to the Danish royal family has been closely followed here as she becomes the world's first Australian-born queen. It is clear that there is nothing but fair skies and blessings ahead for the royal couple as we cheer them on from across the globe. Mahesh? All right, uh, Binet Seneviratna, other than a world news special correspondent reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Thank you very much. Now, 100 days ago, the previously unthinkable happened in Israel. A state born out of adversity and war only 75 years ago woke up to what some ha have since described as a threat to its very existence. Just after dawn, 100 days ago, thousands of heavily armed Hamas fighters stormed through and over the Gaza border fence in several different places in order to create chaos in Israel. A grim milestone in the Israel-Hamas war. 100 days of bloodshed with no end in sight. And 100 days that hostages have been captive in Gaza. A balloon for each day set free into the Tel Aviv sky. 
This war is now the longest between Israel and the Palestinians since Israel's founding 75 years ago. And the deadliest. Just under 24,000 people killed in Gaza, the Hamas-run health ministry there says. That's 1% of the population. The UN says Gaza is now on the verge of famine. The suffering in Gaza fueling rallies from London and Italy to Washington. As Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu vows to bring every hostage home and to keep fighting until the end. Let's take a short commercial break. You're watching World News with me. Welcome back, everyone, to World News Tonight. Now, the main street in Des Moines leading to the state capitol building uh, is covered by a thick layer of snow as icicles dangle from uh, signs welcoming visitors to the home of the famous Iowa caucuses. Month of campaigning led to the Iowa caucus, which begins today, a state version of a primary election, which kicks off the race to the White House, where Republican uh, vote for their preferred candidate to be president is being searched. Following the latest for us tonight is other learners, uh, Nicola Senaratna, who is watching the events from New York, and she joins me via Zoom with the latest on that Iowa caucus. Nicola? Yes, Mahesh. With the caucus underway, it seems many contenders are sitting on pins and needles until just hours ago, Republican candidates made their final bid to party members. Severe weather has disrupted some of the proceedings. Former President Donald Trump began the last day of campaigning in bitter cold Iowa, boosted by new polling showing him with a dominant lead among Republicans as his closest competitors. Haley and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis continued their jockeying for second place. Fear snow lashed swaths of Iowa with blizzard warnings in effect. Trump himself has voiced concern that the severe weather could hamper proceedings and the overall turnout in the state's traditional primary session kickoff. With the result yet to be announced, it's left to be confirmed who will emerge the victor in this tight race. Back to you, Mahesh. Indeed, uh, by tomorrow we'll know exactly who the winner is. Uh, Nicholas Senaratna reporting from New York with regard to the caucuses in Iowa. Thank you very much. Now, the Iowa caucuses mark the first contest in the 2024 presidential election. Now, what is a caucus and what does it mean? Here's a look. It's time for Iowa to make up its mind. Unlike a primary, when polls are open for several hours or states that allow absentee ballots, the Iowa Republican caucus requires mandatory in-person attendance 7 p.m. Monday night. There are about 1,600 individual caucuses held statewide. Only registered Republicans can participate. The only candidate who can beat Joe Biden. First up, someone speaks on behalf of each candidate. Then votes are cast on secret paper ballots. One, two, three. And counted in front of the crowd before final results are reported to the state party. Nikki Haley had three. Anyone caucus last time? In Mason City, they're trying to avoid issues on caucus night by rehearsing. Julie Billings walked 40 fellow Republicans through a mock caucus last week. Guys, order. One goal is to ensure the number of votes cast matches the number of people in the room. Just 186,000 people participated in the last competitive GOP caucus in 2016, a third of the state's registered Republicans. Put another way, it's just 0.0005% of all Americans. Iowa Republicans have a bad track record of picking their party's eventual nominee. Not since 2000, when George W. Bush harvested a victory here, did Iowa Republicans get it right. All prison staff uh, who were seized as hostages during prison riots in Ecuador amidst a sharp uptick in violence have been released. Prison officials announced that security protocols and the joint work of the police and the National Army enable the release of all hostages who were being held in various prisons across the country. Video released by the Ecuadorian military shows what it says was the demolition of a wall as part of an operation to free prison staff 
held hostage by inmates inside. And the SNAI prison agency on Saturday said all hostages had been freed. SNAI said 158 guards and 20 administrative staff had been seized since last Monday in several prisons. This footage from Saturday shows an unnamed officer telling family members of the hostages about the successful release. Dear family members, the National Police together with the armed forces have freed the hostages. They have been deprived of their freedom for six days. They will be handed over to families. They have received a medical checkup. There has been no issue. This is a joint effort. The incident is part of an escalating security crisis in the country that worsened this week. Gunmen stormed a TV station on air. Unexplained explosions were set off in several cities, and police officers were kidnapped. The government declared a state of emergency last week and said that so far, more than 1,000 people have been arrested. Ecuadorian soldiers were patrolling at the shared border with Colombia on Saturday as part of the operation. Now, anti-corruption crusader Bernardo Arvelo was sworn in as Guatemala's president in the early hours of today after a chaotic inauguration that was delayed for hours by a last-ditch attempt by Congress opponents to weaken his authority. Now, the latest in a series of legislative setbacks triggered by opponents uh, uncensored the challenges Arvelo faces as leader of Central America's most populous nation, to which he has pledged to bring sweeping reforms and tackle the rising cost of living and violence, key drivers of the migration to the United States. Leftist Bernardo Arevalo was sworn in as Guatemala's new president after the ceremony was delayed for hours by hostile lawmakers prompting international calls for the election outcome to be honoured. The delay to the inauguration was the latest legislative setback Arevalo has faced since he swept a victory in an August election, vowing to stamp out corruption and restore democracy in Central America's most populous country. The swearing-in at Congress was delayed after Guatemala's top court decided earlier on Sunday that lawmakers from Arevalo's own Semilla party could take their seats as independents a move that dilutes the party's presence and weakens the president-elect's power. The international community, including the United States, has piled vast pressure on Jamate's administration to proceed with the transition of power. New efforts have bypassed uh, barri barriers to protect a town in Iceland from lava, with the country's prime minister calling it a very serious situation and a top official saying it's the worst case scenario. The volcanic eruption occurred uh, last morning near Grendavik, the town evacuated uh, in November before a massive eruption from the same peninsula. A volcano erupted in southwest Iceland on Sunday. It's the second volcanic eruption on the Reykjanes Peninsula in less than a month. The eruption, which began in the early hours, posed an immediate threat to a small nearby fishing town. But authorities said that the area north of Grindavik had been evacuated the previous day, over fears that an outbreak was imminent amid an uptick in seismic activity. Early morning video footage from the site showed fountains of molten rock and bright orange lava spewing from fissures in the ground. Authorities have been building barriers of earth and rock in recent weeks to try to prevent lava from reaching Grindavik, some 25 miles southwest of the capital Reykjavik. But the latest eruption appeared to have penetrated the town's defences. The Icelandic Meteorological Office said lava was flowing towards the town and had come within an estimated 1,500 feet. A spokesperson told public broadcaster RUV that, based on flow models, it could take the lava a few hours to reach Grindavik if it continued to head towards the town. The eruption marks the fifth in Reykjanes since 2021. Well, North Korea today claimed to have again tested a missile that could become one of uh, the world's fastest and most accurate weapon, with the potential to be fitted uh, with a nuclear warhead ultimately. North Korea's state media claimed Monday that it successfully tested a solid-fuel intermediate-range ballistic missile, carrying a hypersonic warhead the day before, as part of the regime's regular activities to develop its weapon systems. It said the test firing did not affect the security of neighboring countries and that it had nothing to do with any situation in the region. The North fired the missile toward waters off its east coast at about 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. 
The South Korean military assessed that the missile, launched from an area near Pyongyang, appears to have been an intermediate-range ballistic missile that traveled about a thousand kilometers before landing in the East Sea. It added that it shared information on the missile with the U.S. and Japan and that it's analyzing further details of the launch. In the meantime, the top nuclear envoys from the three nations held a phone call on Sunday and strongly condemned the launch. They said the latest launch has once again shown that North Korea's illegal provocations are the causes of instability in the region and warned that the security cooperation between the three countries will only become stronger as the regime continues to engage in more provocations. Sunday's missile launch comes about two months after the North claimed to have successfully tested new solid fuel engines for intermediate-range ballistic missiles. Solid fuel-powered missiles are harder to detect than liquid fuel ones. And intermediate-range missiles have a maximum range of 5,500 kilometers, which means they're capable of striking U.S. military bases in Guam or Okinawa in Japan. Meanwhile, the North state media also said its foreign minister Choi son has left Pyongyang to visit Russia. It said her visit from Monday to Wednesday is at the invitation of her Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. The two isolated governments have been forging ties following a rare summit between their leaders last September. Officials from South Korea and the U.S. have said the North appears to be supplying military equipment to Russia for use in its war with Ukraine, while Russia was providing technological support for the North's satellite and missile program. More world news right after this. Stick around. Welcome back everyone to World News. Uh, now the award season is upon us. About uh, uh, a couple of weeks back we saw the Golden Globes. Now it's the Critics' Choice. Now these days everyone um, can be a critic. But there's only one Critics' Choice Awards where the professionally uh, skeptical to pick, uh, get to pick their favorite film and television of the previous year. Last year's host Chelsea Handler returned to oversee the ceremony where Oppenheimer led all films nominees with eight wins. The Critics' Choice Awards was a night full of spectacular wins, powerful speeches, and fun celebrity moments. The biggest award of the night, Best Picture, went to Oppenheimer. The cast also took home Best Acting Ensemble, and Christopher Nolan was awarded Best Director. Emma Stone won Best Actress for Poor Things and told the crowd she was in total shock over her win. She called playing her character, Bella Baxter, quote, one of the greatest joys of my life and joked that while she was grateful to the critics for this honor, she was learning not to care what they think. Paul Giamatti took home Best Actor for The Holdovers, and in his speech, he honored his late father, a literary critic who never got to see him work as a professional actor. Paul's co-star Davine Joy Randolph took home Best Supporting Actress, and Best Supporting Actor went to Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer. And during his acceptance speech, he hilariously read some of his less than favorable reviews from critics in his career, including one that described him as, quote, amusing as a bedlocked fart. Barbie also got the spotlight when I'm Just Ken won Best Song, and Mark Ronson thanked Ryan Gosling for making the audience fall in love with the musical number. Barbie star America Ferreira had a huge Critics' Choice Awards moment when she accepted the See Her Award and gave a powerful speech about representation in media. The Career Achievement Award went to Harrison Ford, and he got a standing ovation from the whole audience. In his touching acceptance speech, he credited his success to luck and the work of his incredible collaborators. When it came to the television honors, Succession had a huge night, winning Best Drama Series. Kieran Culkin and Sarah Snook took home Best Actor and Actress in a Drama, respectively, and they were all smiles backstage. Meanwhile, the bear crushed it on the comedy categories, with the show and its stars Jeremy Allen White, Eben Moss Backrack, and Iowa Debris all winning their awards. Well, One Direction's uh, Zayn Malik's collaboration with popular Pakistani band Or has given fans much to celebrate, with many psyched that the British singer is fluent in Urdu. A remake of Our's uh, breakout uh, hit, uh, which I do not know how to pronounce properly, features the X1 Direction uh, singer providing vocals in Urdu. The original version of the song has more than 95 million views through the remake, released uh, last Friday. Though the remake uh, released last Friday is fast catching up with 3 million views, Malik said that he was incredibly humbled when the band reached out to him. Well, here's a heartwarming story, a, uh, a story of a good grandson. 
Barbara Rico's uh, grandson gave her a life-changing gift helping publishing the children's book she wrote back in 1972. Now, after a video of her reaction was posted on social media, the book became a bestseller on Amazon. For Barbara Rico and her grandson, Chad Cooper, this new year is beyond belief. Hello. I have a gift for you. Okay. That's because last month, Chad surprised Barbara with a gift more than 50 years in the making and posted her reaction on social media. Got the present for me. What is it? Here, Moose. What's in here? In that bag, a children's book based on an unpublished manuscript Barbara wrote way back in 1972. Barbara couldn't believe her eyes. Oh my God, this is probably the nicest thing anybody's ever done for me in my entire life. In my entire life, <laughs> this is the nicest thing. I adore him. I love him to death. When you make believe, you can be anything but the little girl so poor. The book called More, More, More is based on an underprivileged little girl Barbara once knew who teaches other kids about gratitude. For decades, Barbara couldn't find a publisher. She'd told Chad all about it. And one day, he spotted her book file on her computer. And now More, More, More has become a number one bestseller. Comments filled with love are now pouring in online from across the country. OMG, yes, you made it, Grandma. To be seen and acknowledged for what we're passionate about is all anyone ever wants. Even I'm a kindergarten teacher. This book will now be in my classroom library. It's coming from their heart. Barbara says it's all been a blessing. I feel like I've done something important in my life now. And all I want to do is just give everyone a hug. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Oh, such a good grandson. Her reaction makes your heart feel glee. Well, that is uh, from the World News Tonight team for this Monday night. Uh, I will be back again tomorrow at the same time with another edition of World News. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.